Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session. And we will start this afternoon session by uh, a talk by Thomas Riecher and Timon Masur. And Thomas Riecher is an IT specialist in system integration. And after five years working in discrete manufacturing at MES uh, Consulting, he has been building microservices in the area of Home Connect and firmware updates for millions of devices as an architect at BSH since 2017. And he's accompanied by Thielmann Masur, who is a software consultant at TNG, which actually has a background in extra uh, an exoplanet search. And he is now consulting at BSH as a full stack uh, developer since early 2022. And he has focused on microservices and web apps related to user identity and profiles in home in the home connect app and he also introduced in there now the backstage as a new software catalog for home connect and it actually has begun as a small innovation topic but turned out to his into his pet project and he has now been dri driving it for over a year and the project actually combines his passion for modern system architecture and develop productivity. So let's see how these two guys are taming the Home Connect microservice jungle and what the backstage software catalog actually is. Thank you. Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm Tillman. Welcome, I'm Thomas. It's good to see so many people here. Originally, I thought that the three blue one brown talk was going to be at the same slot. So I expected to hold the talk in front of an uh, empty room, but I'm much happier to do it um, with all of you. So that's great. Um, yeah, we want to take you on a little journey about um, how we are managing our mess of uh, microservices at Home Connect and how we are using the open source um, backstage software cat catalog um, to do so. Uh, but Thomas, to start off, what even is Home Connect? Well, thank you. So what is Home Connect and who is even BSH? You just saw the logo on the title slide, but many don't recognize it. So who are we? We build home appliances for your daily use. So if you're cooking in the kitchen, if you're doing your laundry, um, if you're just uh, washing the dishes afterwards, you're probably using these home appliances and you're in Germany at least even probably using some of us because we are the company behind these brands of home appliances. And we started connecting them with Home Connect almost 10 years ago and the main usage, many of the uh, Home Connect users use it as our Home Connect app. And Home Connect is not very small and BS Edge is also not really small. So um, we're actually a 60,000 plus employee company with production facilities around the world and we build millions of these home appliances. And that's a big driver of all the complexity behind our system. And Home Connect is live since I mentioned almost 10 years. Um, we are rolled out in over 60 countries. We sold, sold tens of millions of appliances. We have many partners integrated and uh, the app is available in many languages. And um, well, these are all the complexity drivers that we have there. And um, now with this bit of context out of the way, back to Tillman, who will tell us a bit about the microservice context. Awesome. Okay, I hope uh, I won't bore you for too long, but uh, I have to start with a bit of history. Um, how did we uh, get here um, with us all working or uh, with us working with microservices? And historically, um, uh, the monolith uh, was the default architecture for software, um, especially uh, back in the day when software components weren't as large as some of the backends are today. You just put um, all of your software, all of your code into one large chunk and deployed it into production. This had a lot of uh, advantages. It's just um, the simplest way to go, the simplest um, architecture of solution, just one, one big thing. And it's also efficient because um, everything happens inside one process or at least inside one machine. So you have few remote calls via the network, for example. 
Um, but it turned out that this also has uh, many downsides. Um, for example, multiple teams will be working on these monoliths because they be can become quite large, so you need multiple teams, and this can lead to a lot of um, just conflict and overhead in, in the coordination. Then they're slow to deploy just because they're large artifacts, just uploading them to the productive environment uh, will take quite some time. And um, there's nothing in the nature of a monolith that forces you to like to split your code, to factor it well. Um, so we all know uh, we have good um, resolutions at the beginning of a year to always factor our code very nicely and keep it clean. Um, but with monoliths, it's way easier, let's say, to, to slip into just a big ball of mud, as you can see with this beautiful house plant over there and the roots. Um, you might be very much in love with the plant, but it's a, it's a mess to keep track of. And then uh, lastly, the monolith can only be scaled as a unit. So there might be a lot of different functionality in this monolith, um, but uh, you can only scale all of it or, or none of it, at least um, when going about it in the simplest way. So what was the next step in the evolution once people realized it? We started seeing um, service-oriented architectures or microservice architectures um, beginning in the 2010s. And a microservice architecture is just where your backend consists not of one big app, but of many smaller apps that talk to each other via the network. And these, each of these um, smaller microservices um, really takes care of one part of the business domain. So um, it's cleanly factored. And the advantages are that each microservice only gets worked on by one team, and this reduces these, these conflicts. Um, it's quick to deploy because each artifact is much smaller. Um, yeah, it forces you to really think about the factoring because, um, yeah, you, you have to split the big thing into smaller things. Um, the horizontal scaling is built in, so it's uh, very natural to, if you have a small piece of functionality, to just multiply it and have several replicas of one microservice running. Um, also, for each piece of functionality that now is not in one big thing anymore, but in a separate microservice, you can choose the best technolo technology stack um, for this functionality. And it's also more resilient. So um, if you imagine microservice as, as, a, as a garden with many um, smaller plants, if one of these plants dies, it's sad, but you can um, remove it and plant something else there. Um, so it's not a single point of failure as, as monoliths can be. Uh, overall, microservices really empower teams and espouse a part of um, the Agile philosophy to give choices to teams. Each team has full control of their service, of the deployment, and also of the technology's choices and, and the code in there. But with this additional autonomy that teams have, we also can run into some problems. Um, for example, the ecosystem overall that you're building can fracture much faster. And especially, you can have many teams using just very diverse different technologies, which might not even be necessary. There can be very different conventions uh, across different repositories, coding conventions, and also the tooling becomes more complex because you need special tooling to deploy all these small artifacts, to configure it, to log and monitor it, or you need async messaging tools like Kafka and so on. Um, so this adds a lot of complexity. Also, um, it could be that you have less reusability because, again, you have uh, varying conventions across these microservices. Um, overall, the architecture is much more complex because you don't just have one artifact which talks um, to the user and back, but you have uh, many services um, building a network, talking to each other, and similarly, your organizational structure might also become uh, much more complex. And lastly, um, you will have less overview over the whole solution just because of this complexity. So architects planning um, the future um, of the, the backend evolution or business side and also developers, for example, once they're onboarded, it's just much more complicated to get an overview over how, how the whole um, system works. And Backstage actually, as we will see later, tries to address um, all of these issues. Okay, um, how did Home Connect actually um, come into contact with microservices? Well, 
as I said, we started at around 2010 with, or 10 years ago, 2013, 14 with Home Connect. And um, back then, as a German industry company, we, of course, basically bought the server from a supplier. And we had this is both what Home Connect does. We have an app, out of house connection via the server to the home appliance, can also communicate in house. And the server provides the functionality to many, many ecosystem providers. But it was basically also the architecture diagram, monolithic app, monolithic backend servers, and uh, we have the um, functionality on the home appliances. And then we started with our second generation of home appliances, and we needed a better firmware update for that. And then we decided, well, um, over in Silicon Valley, they are doing this fancy thing with all these microservices. Let's not put this in the um, big server, but let's start with the microservices ourselves. So I don't want to bore you with the dozens, millions microservice diagram uh, you've seen probably over the years. So how does a microservice look on a green field? It looks something like this. Because we all know for some reason microservices are hexagonal. So this was basically our start into microservices. Um, we had on the other side our big service server and we started with our microservices then. And we said, yeah, well, this looks nice. And then the team started building more and more microservices. And then the landscape uh, grew and grew. And then we did a re-evaluation and said, yeah, this microservice thing, this is actually nice. And we implemented the firmware update faster than we could have done it in the big server. So we told more teams to uh, build microservices. And as you can clearly see, the first set of microservices, these are Spring Boot services. And the next team decided, ah, Spring Boot, nah, that's not our thing. We want to build TypeScript services. So we started building a bunch of Node services, and our landscape got a bit diverse, but it's still manageable. You can see, OK, there's this one cluster, there's a bit of another cluster. And it's still uh, quite a good overview. And then we said, well, with this knowledge, we feel kind of comfortable to take the big server we bought by this one supplier and put it in the same ecosystem. And there it is. So we have this third technology in there, because this is not a node service. It's also not a Spring Boot service. This is a big, fat Scala cluster with 20 nodes, depending on the region and how we scale it. But yet another thing. And at that point in time, we grew to more and more teams and more and more technologies and more and more people made more and more decisions about what to build. And so the whole landscape grew and grew. And then um, we said, well, we're starting to connect really a lot of home appliances. It would be really interesting to see if there are some interesting data in all these things. So. What do we do as a big corporation? We connect our big corporate data lake to it and get all the data from all the microservices, no matter which technology it is, into, these, um, into the data lake. And um, well, then we said, well, this is really, we still believe in it. And then we kind of started hyperscaling it with a lot more teams. So now there are more than a couple dozen teams working on these things, and they're all doing their own technology decisions with some guidance. So um, cannot get too crazy, but um, at the end of the day, it gets uh, more and more diverse. And now the landscape looks more or less something like this. So you can also see clearly that some of the um, Services haven't been touched for a while. It gets a bit rougher underground there. But basically, it gets less and less um, transparent uh, what we actually uh, have there because we have so many teams. And so um, when we look at this, our uh, architecture, then we have on the top left now, we have millions of users in our Home Appliance, uh, in our Home Connect app. We have um, even more millions of home appliances connected to the systems. And we have um, over 50 partners who are using this. Um, and we're doing this um, because that complexity was just not enough for us. We are doing this in four regions um, and uh, connected to all the usual corporate backends. And so now this is actually 200 plus services 
which, of which over a thousand instances of services are running. So, um, of course, if we're one, running such a system or overall solution, then people come and start asking questions like, well, this service's functionality, who even owns this? Who do I have to talk to if I want to change something over there? Um, or some of you might remember a few years, <laughs> a few weeks before Christmas, and then the question comes, well, where the hell are we using log4j? Hmm, it'd be interesting to know, right? Um, or is that service available in that certain region, or have we only deployed it as an MVP in one region? Or is there another team uh, who is building a Kotlin service because I maybe we want to connect these for a community of practice? And all these kinds of questions um, about which uh, information might be used by another service that I put on a Kafka topic, or um, is there another information where, which I, where's an API for that I can request somewhere? All these questions get harder and harder to answer because you have to document it somehow. And as I said, in the journey, basically started out with a few little teams. And of course, at that point in time, our service catalog were basically people. So people who knew what they were doing. And so the problem with people is this scales terribly. Um, the memory of people is not really great, especially over a long time. Um, the version control is even worse. <laughs> and the SLA in summer times is also not great. So we started, what are we doing? We are putting everything in Wiki because Wiki solves everything, as everybody knows. So turns out that's also not really a good idea if it gets a bit bigger. So it's not really integrated in the development workflow because developers work in repositories, architects work in repositories, and Wiki is more like the corporate thing you have to do. So not really good, well integrated. It's really distant from the code, and in the end, it's never up to date because people forget to update documentation, especially if it's very far from what you do otherwise. Then we started building our own service catalog as a self-built app in an innovation iteration. Um, we are developing, we are safe, but it turns out building this from scratch is quite high implementation and maintenance effort. And um, we also didn't quite knew in the beginning what we actually wanted there or needed there, which also led then that this buy-in from stakeholders, be it product managers, architects, people who have to finance this, or also the other teams who have to provide information was really bad, actually. And so um, that is the point where I said, well, we have to do something differently. And with that, we come to you backstage and also back to Tillman. Awesome. Uh, so now we've heard a lot about um, the evolution of microservices at Home Connect, the problems this also brings, and some of the previous solutions that were tried. So let's get into backstage um, our current uh, attempt at solving these problems, which we've now been developing for yeah over a year. So the backstage maintainers themselves. Um, uh, present these two paradoxes uh, on the website, the speed paradox and the standards paradox, which is a different phrasing of uh, what we've already explained a bit. Speed paradox, um, with microservices, you empower teams to really do their own thing and develop quickly, but this leads to the whole ecosystem um, becoming more fractured and complex, and in the end slows us down again. And the standards paradox um, uh, means that, um, yeah, if we uh, define some standards that teams need to need to follow, like some basic technologies that teams should use, it sounds like it restricts autonomy of the teams, but in the end just takes um, unnecessary choices uh, away and therefore also um, frees up capacity. And Backstage addresses um, these two paradoxes mainly by uh, yeah, collecting uh, microservice metadata and, and making it available and searchable in one place um, and also uh, the whole ecosystem of tooling in one place and then it uh, dries, um, do not, don't repeat yourselves, uh, common microservice tasks in one place to, uh, so not every team has to re-implement this. Um, Backstage itself was originally started by Spotify, but is now being developed by an open source uh, community. 
and they themselves describe it as a, an open platform for building developer portals. So Backstage is open source and it gives you a, a tools, um, toolkit to set up such a, such a service catalog, such a developer portal um, at your organization. The main goals um, that Backstage pursues is um, firstly to reveal the high level architecture um, of your solution and the dependencies between um, components, software components, APIs, etc. Secondly, about every service you can find out um, more details, who owns it, links to documentation and so on. Um, it wants to drive technology standardization and we will see how this works. Um, it should speed up onboarding just because people can get a simpler overview over the whole system and then also um, lead to productivity increases for developers by reducing context uh, switches by collecting uh, much information in one place. The main features, wait, I have this clicker thing, why am I using the keyboard? Um, are the software catalog. Um, this is basically just a table or yeah, a, a catalog of all the components and APIs and um, it models your ecosystem according to like services, APIs, teams and so on. Uh, secondly, there's a powerful view for APIs, which includes the Swagger UI right inside Backstage. Then there's a, a search feature which, with which you can search your API documentations, uh, other docs, and so on. And there's a tech docs plugin to have your documentation right inside uh, Backstage, though we currently don't use this yet. Uh, there's a templating feature um, which allows you to quickly set up a new microservice from your, your demo repository. And overall, Backstage is highly extensible via um, custom front and backend plugins to really um, make it fit your needs. Okay, so what, uh, what does Backstage look like? Backstage, I guess, uh, the tech stack. Um, but wait a second, this slide is kind of boring. So uh, let's see what Backstage itself can tell us about Backstage. So I'll sit down to start the demo. Nice. All right. So this is our actual uh, backstage instance that we see now, um, and this is the main uh, the main plugin, the service catalog. So on the right, you see the list of components, and I've already filtered this down to just show us um, the backstage component itself inside this catalog. Um, so if we click through to here, we now are on the page for the backstage component itself, and here we get a lot of just overview information. Um, we see that it's owned by Team Who, and we see it's a web app, and we see that it uses Node.js, TypeScript, React, Express. So we already get a rough idea of the tech stack. And then on the right hand side, there is a graph of the dependencies. And we can here, for example, already see yeah, who is the owner, and that there is an API called the Backstage API, which is provided by the Backstage component itself. Um, scrolling down. Here's a section with links um, to our Slack channel and um, yeah, our team Slack and so on. And down here we see some subcomponents. So we see that Backstage has a front end and a back, back end. Very surprising. Okay. Um, now I'll go up here. I click on this um, edit uh, uh, button. And this takes me right to the rep repository where this component is actually defined, where all this information is stored, which is right inside the backstage repository and in this YAML file. And uh, people who've worked with Kubernetes will recognize the syntax. It's uh, very similar and uses similar conventions to Kubernetes uh, configurations. Um, you just define a, a component, so like a software component with a name, description. You can add the links here. And then you can, for example, define this relation um, that uh, Backstage provides the Backstage API. So it's extremely simple. And down here, um, for example, we have a, uh, the Backstage API defined, so there's a different ki kind of component or kind of entity that you can define. And this lives right next to the, to the actual code. Um, so let's go back to um, Backstage. We can click on the API tab. And now here we see um, the Backstage API that Backstage provides. And now we can click on the API definition and get the, the Swagger UI uh, right away. 
Um, last thing to show here, this additional data tab. And this is actually something that we customly added, so basically like a little plugin to Backstage. Um, so this doesn't come out of the box, everything else does. And here's some metadata about the repository that we automatically scrape. And then down here, um, we have a list of dependencies that are automatically extracted from all the package JSON files that are in the repository. And we can, for example, search for uh, Axios, some library, and now we see, okay, yeah, Axios is used uh, in Backstage in version 1.4, and it lives in the backend package JSON. So this is something we built uh, customly. All right, let's switch back to the presentation. Okay, so I want to talk a bit more about the process of how we introduced um, Backstage at Home Connect. And this will give you a rough overview, and then I will get into more um, details for, for these steps uh, afterwards. So first step, obviously, is to set up and deploy the Backstage app, and this is extremely simple. To set it up locally takes five minutes, and then deploy it to your infrastructure. Um, then, next step, yeah, create a how-to for um, the teams that are supposed to now document their services, um, what data do we want, and then um, encourage them to add their services. So sometimes I felt a bit like, uh, like this, running around, um, encouraging teams to document their um, the components, and this consists of defining a data model. Um, Backstage already uh, gives a data model, but some things need to, some standards and conventions need to be set. And it's an ongoing process, obviously, to keep this information uh, up to date and extend the data model, get more stuff in there. Um, at this point, uh, Backstage um, got declared basically the, the new official uh, service catalog, so it replaced the, the V2, and um, Yes. Um, next step, we um, created templates for our demo repositories, which allows the quick setup of new, new microservices and micro web apps, and I'll demo that later. Um, and then we um, created a proof of concept for the plugin mechanism um, to try out how this, this customization actually works with a pr uh, rather simple uh, front end uh, component that we added. Uh, and more recently, um, we've been uh, working on making the whole data model more adapt to, to our specific uh, needs we have at Home Connect, mainly with respect to modeling our, our environments. Uh, Thomas already mentioned uh, the regions that our services get deployed into or that our services uh, serve. Uh, and this has been the most recent um, developments. All right, so let's talk in a bit more detail about uh, the data model. So much of this is already uh, comes out of the box with Backstage. So here I show um, four main kinds of entities that Backstage understands, that Backstage data model understands. We have groups, which are like um, yeah, teams or with uh, us safe uh, shapes. Um, we have components, which are like software components, um, resources, which are more like uh, hardware um, or like um, databases, buckets and then there can be APIs. And these little boxes below, or shapes below, are types. And these are not predefined by Backstage, but you can define them whatever your organization needs. For us, for example, we obviously have, um, okay, this pointer doesn't work very well. We have an, an app, or actually two apps, Android and iOS, and so these have the type app, app then. And in addition to these um, entities, there are obviously relations between them, which are very important to get an overview of the architecture. And here I just show some of the main ones. So groups can own components, and this you can model. Then components can depend on resources and vice versa. And components can consume or uh, provide APIs. And all of this you simply define in your, in your YAML files. Speaking of YAML files, um, obviously the, the data, getting the data into Backstage is the most important part. So um, teams, uh, once they want to add their services to Backstage, have to identify um, all of the entities that belong to their uh, team, meaning services, APIs, resources, pipelines, uh, whatever you want, and then create these YAML files directly in the repositories where these artifacts live. Um, uh, exactly, that's what I just said. 
And the, the main things we focused on in the beginning at least is that uh, teams add links to their documentation and other tools like CI and so on. Um, at the ownership, obviously, uh, the correct team is assigned to these components, and then the relations to other services to start building up the, the whole network. And these um, uh, YAML files are automatically discovered from Bitbucket, so there's no need to uh, manually register them anymore or anything. Okay. Um, We've talked about stand the technology standardization, and probably many people have already also been here. When adding functionality to, uh, when you want to add functionality, sometimes it sounds easiest to add it to an existing service, even though this would be bad factoring, when it would actually be the right thing to add a new service, but this is much more effort. Backstage, want, backstage wants to help there with its template mechanism. Um, and this is basically a set of highly configurable backend actions. And some of them come out of the box, but you can develop your own. So um, the default actions that are available is like checking out a repository, obviously. Um, the templates that we uh, build are based on our uh, microservice demo repositories, which shows like our best practices for, for node services um, in this case. Um, and you just type in the new service name or repository name that you want, and it then uh, clones the repo um, and pushes it with the correct branches um, in a new, yeah, creates a new repository, sets some permissions, um, it also opens a pull request in our CI configuration a repository and, and some other things. All right, and I will demo this as well. Let's see if the demo gods are with us. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this is what the templating me mechanism looks like in the front end. It's basically a form. I already filled in um, our Bitbucket project uh, where this will be created and a Jira ticket number which will be um, used to name the pull request, for example. And I can choose the um, default branch and the, let's say, production branch name. And then as a repository or, or service name, uh, test service, awesome. The next step uh, just gives me an overview and I confirm. And now this takes a few seconds. Awesome, went through. And now it gives me a link to uh, the new repository, test service repository, was just created, as you can see. Um, and you have uh, your, your two branches here. And also a link to the pull request that was opened in, uh, in the Jenkins, in our Jenkins repository, um, just with the uh, um, Jenkins files here, uh, con correctly configured. So this is ready to be approved by the Jenkins admins. Uh, where do I find my presentation? There we go. All right. Um, yeah, and this is the way that Backstage uh, tries to help with technology standardization. Because if you have the choice to simply click a few buttons to set up a new um, service, then you're uh, much more likely to do it and then also keep your technologies a bit more harmonized across the whole um, organization. Um, Next up are the custom plugin that we built. Um, here's a screenshot. It's basically a simple way to search for these um, dependencies that I also already showed you um, for the backstage component, but across all components that you have and see the versions. So you can, for example, um, we don't have Java dependencies in there yet, but you could search for log4j uh, and look at, at the version number there. And uh, this was more or less a proof of concept for us. Um, and the data that is shown there is uh, ingested also in the back end um, with custom so-called processors, something we use quite a lot. So this is a way to attach additional information to your, um, to your components when they are uh, scraped from Bitbucket. Exactly, yeah, so this is just a simple uh, React component that um, shows this in a table and lets you filter it. And the goal really is, um, and the idea behind Backstage that teams can in the future independently develop such plugins for their own needs and make use of all the data that is provided um, by the service catalog API. 
Okay, so what I want you to take away uh, from this section is um, that Backstage really needs to be customized or wants to be customized to the needs of your organization by extending the data model and there's documentation about how best to do it or maybe how not to do it. Um, scraping your custom information sources, um, integrate your, your demo repositories if you have some, and then ultimately the most flexible thing where you can basically build anything you want is with these custom front and backend plugins. So uh, obviously this, this needs some investment, it doesn't come for free, but still it's, it's very powerful. Um, some of the limitations uh, we came across, but that also um, the backstage developers are actively um, working on improving the testing of your entity files once you write them, and also if you have errors like syntax or, or some other errors in your um, YAMLs, um, it's a bit cumbersome right now, but they're uh, improving that. And there are open source plugins available, for example, for Vault or to integrate with Jenkins, but many of these are still quite, quite simple. Yeah, overall, yeah, backstage, some backstage features are uh, still in alpha. All right. Um, so I hope you got an impression how you can use Backstage to build a, a little tool shed and ensure that your um, cute microservice garden doesn't become a unwieldy uh, jungle. Um, but uh, Thomas, why do you think actually that Backstage worked uh, well at Home Connect? Well, why did it work at Home Connect? Um, the skip on. Um, so because the developers just can do it in their uh, code bases. So it is integrated in the, in the workflow, and now we don't have to run around in Wiki and see, oh, somebody forgot. I, don't, I know he forgot, but I, I don't know what the actual current state is. So this is a big thing, and um, what we also noticed, especially com when compared to our own um, basically invention, it has enough initial capability that it, the, the benefit is clear and so we got um, uh, en enough buy-in from not just stakeholders like me, architects and product managers, but also from the other teams who have to actually document it because they saw a benefit in, in, in it as well. And um, uh, last but not least is, uh, is extensible enough to be extended to different groups. So if we talk with our security department and they want to see the software bombs or whatnot, we can say, well, we have a tool here which uh, might very easily be uh, adapted to cover your needs as well. And uh, these things combined led to that uh, we actually are using Backstage now, many of us on a daily or at least weekly basis. And uh, we want to give you some uh, guidelines if maybe it would be worth to try this out at your organization. Um, we tried to put some numbers on it, but uh, don't hold us to them. Uh, it's, it's rough. Um, if you have more than 10 services, microservices, or APIs at your organization, um, and more than three teams, uh, it might be worth to get started on this. Um, if you already have demo repositories for um, your microservices uh, with best practices, it's very easy to convert them to uh, templates. In, overall, it's very cheap to try out because the setup is so simple and you can get started with the basic data model uh, basically within a day. And uh, what definitely helps is to have a platform team with some ca uh, capacity to take on the ownership because then you can really develop the customizations uh, quickly. Obviously, this whole thing is not free productivity. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, these things have to be built. Um, and then some of the features, mainly like the error feedback and the um, testing of entities before you add them to your repository is still um, in alpha. That's it from us. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. So I think we, we have the first question here, and then we'll go through the room. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, so as I understand it, Backstage primarily provides a catalog for the service repositories, the builds. In how far does it also support um, maintaining a catalog of the deployed instances of those service, services? 
Uh, yeah, good question and something we've uh, we've definitely been uh, struggling with. Um, the idea of, of Backstage and they write as much in the documentation is to be not too close to the deployment view. They actually address this very question, uh, how do I model my, my deployed, deployed instances, uh, let's say, and say, um, yeah, you should really only, you should not create separate um, components within Backstage for that because it goes a bit against the idea. They w really want all of the information to be within one, um, yeah, one component for the whole service. Um, you can definitely, I mean, write your own customi customizations that pulls uh, information from your deployment environment. For example, there is, a, there is a Kubernetes plugin for Backstage, which is, I think, also quite powerful. I've never, I've never actually tried it out, but this would then obviously show you um, the pods that are running or the, the containers and so on. Um, but out of, with this basic data model that I showed you, just which just says components, service, and so on, there's not much mention of, of the deployments. Thank you. So if I want to back at least a few people, yeah. there, because I don't want to. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, my question would be, if you had to do this all over again, meaning this migration from the monolith uh, to your microservice architecture, at which point would you recommend to introduce Backstage? So right from the very beginning or maybe later when you have some complexity to actually see benefits from it? Probably when you extend past the first team already, because um, at the end of the day, uh, the benefits of Backstage, which having the the documentation in the code. I mean, developers have been telling us this for decades. The documentation is in the code, and that's the only thing they touch in their workflow. So, really starting very early on, because all the others were basically a pain. Um, and also, I mean, uh, sorry, just to add something. Backstage does hit some limitations, I guess, also if you have too much in there. I mean, if we look at the graph with all the components that we have, like, <laughs> It takes minutes to load, and you don't see anything anymore. So um, there's definitely already benefit uh, if you just have a few a few dozen uh, entities in there. Uh, that's kind of what my question is kind of a bit related to, because uh, documentation has different consumers, right? You have mm. you have me as a developer wanting to know where's the API I get the info from I need for the next feature I'm building, but there's also people like architects or security cross people who want to have some zoomed out view or maybe product managers want to have a zoomed out view from a different perspective. Uh, how does Backstage cope with this also in terms of when those people want to change things in the documentation maybe? They can't. The documentation is in the, in the repository. I mean, we link to other things. We have a lot of links there, so you can, of course, um, link a security concept, for example, written by security governance department uh, in this, but the link would be yeah, well put into the repository and then link over there. There's no visualizing part of this configuration. Sorry? Oh, the configuration file is your repository. If your repository tries to visualize YAMLs, probably have to build a plugin for your repository then. Mm -hmm. Maybe to give a bit more background, uh, this question of who are the users of Backstage, uh, we've definitely been thinking out about a lot. I think it's good to focus on uh, use, uses for the engineers because they, in the end, um, need to get a use out of it to document their, all of their components um, well. Um, but there are also some concepts uh, in the model. For example, there's a concept of a domain, which basically groups multiple um, components and resources together into more like a I guess, business domain area. And this is obviously more geared towards, let's say, business people who want to see, hey, um, Home Connect app, who, which services um, deal with recipes, recipes for example. Um, so there's some, uh, yeah, some uh, models for that as well. All right, maybe I would have a short question. So first of all, thank you very much for the nice, uh, insightful and inst instructional uh, talk. 
Um, I was wondering about maybe a little different kind of summary that you gave because like at the beginning you had these questions that people like come to you uh, with uh, in the motivation and I found that very, uh, very nice. And I was wondering the current implementation maybe that you have, do you get answer to all these questions? Uh, are there something that come out of the box? Are there some questions that are more difficult uh, to answer using backstage? Uh, how do you do it? I assume it's via a custom plugin. Maybe if you com could comment uh, on that a little bit, coming back to the to the motivation part of the of the talk, so yeah. to say. Thank you. I mean, you can basically start with the lawyer and what it depends uh, what you're asking, of course. Um, as Tillman said, we don't have the, the Java dependencies in there, so if it's a security issue on, on the Node side, we would find that in our dependencies already, on the Java side not. Uh, stuff would have to be done there. We had the other question regarding the deployments, so we are currently working on having that somehow in our model, but um, yeah, so the easier parts are the ones where I know somehow, okay, I search something about recipes, I want to find out the owner. That's simple. If, if I know the service name or so, so these, uh, these easy questions are all answered and I use it regularly to get these answers. Uh, but the other one, we were on a, on a bit of an extensible road map there. Uh, there's also the question of, um, for many of these questions, there are like more specialized tools available, mm. let's say logs or obviously looking at your deployed environment. So the question of how much do you build with a plugin yourself again, or can you maybe just via the API integrate the most important information into Backstage, or in the simplest case, just provide the link from Backstage yeah. to the tool to quickly get there. Um, yeah. Um, hi, so one question regarding uh, the architecture overview basically, so the software catalog comes with these four constructs, uh, like the components, the API, the groups, and uh, I don't remember what is the fourth one. But um, basically, if you do want to have a good architecture overview also that is represented by domain, where like system context and all these things, then you want to have something like the C4 model, which Spotify did through this custom architecture plugin they say they have. Did you try reaching out to them to try it out or, or to simulate something like that? C C4 model? Yeah, so I there's an architecture model. plugin specifically made for backstage by Spotify, but uh, it's custom by them. So. Uh, no, I haven't no. looked into it. Okay, and uh, then another question that I had basically. Um, so these plugins that you now developed, um, they're just in-house, so they're not something that you open sourced in any way. Um, so the one for custom, for the dependency um, tracing and the other one for the repo stats, they're just. Yeah, I mean right now they're actually in the backstage code base, so we haven't even like um, packaged them up to to make them installable as a, as a node dependency, so currently they're just in, in our backstage instance. And as an effort for setting up the template, um, how much would you say it was basically for you to invest into making this work as you expected? Um, that depends a bit what you want to do. And yeah, I mean for Bitbucket, there's pretty good integration already, um, so you can navigate a Bitbucket repository with a, like an URL reader, um, file reader, which is uh, quite, quite good to use. Um, then creating these, uh, these custom pull requests and so on was basically using the Bitbucket API uh, manually um, to, to create the pull request, name it, um, download the files, um, find and replace basically. Um, but to get to something like this, maybe a person week Thanks for the talk, uh, amazing talk. Um, my question also goes in the same direction with the CI/CD. You only show first at the first beginning of the talk. It was one uh, area with CI/CD. Then you also show shortly uh, how to create over the Bitbucket API the shell scripts. How is this working? Is this inside? of uh, backstage, all the shell scripts that you are running to create something uh, behind the scenes, and how is the link to uh, CI system or automating all this? 
Um, I'm not sure I totally got the connection between these template actions that run. So these template actions run in the backstage backend. In the backstage backend. Yeah. yeah. And then. Um, in some Docker image. Uh, I don't think it's Dockerized, actually, just uh, straight. I mean, uh, we use Cloud Foundry. Um, no. okay. So just a Cloud Foundry image. app. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, uh, my question is if this is like this, if I want to extend my uh, shell scripts or automation, uh, I need other libraries like maybe Python, whatever, and not only shell scripts, because uh, I, I saw that it was shell scripting. But if I want to extend this, how is this possible in backstage? Is it possible? Is it flexible enough to do this? Um, well, we did. We do use some some shell commands, basically from a Node, uh, let's say TypeScript code. So most of the the functionality of these um, the templating backend actions is in, in TypeScript, and then some let's say Git commands, Git pull or something or, or push, we we do um, via shell interface, um, but. Yeah, I mean, you, you just basically have a TypeScript, a Node environment, and you can do anything in there that you can do with, with the Node backend. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you had a wiki and people did update the information in the wiki. Do they update the, uh, the files in the repository? And also, can you add something new, uh, collect some new information from that and tell people to add this information to all their different microservices? Is there some, some support for that? Well, documentation is, of course, still not the favorite thing for developers to do, but it got a lot better. So the backstage catalog is much more up to date than all the previous versions. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you can have a, basically you can have a PR and then the, the other developer from the team can say, well, you forgot to touch the left side of the repository as well, but nobody will check if you actually did something in the wiki, so that's, that's really one of the main benefits. So we do have a question from Slack. Um, so Marco wants to know, um, your, to his understanding, you have an ecosystem of microservices uh, both acting independently and as part of communication chains. But have you ever tried to analyze the system with uh, uh, graph theory and check for redundancies? Because Backstage has graph vis visualization. Does it also have a graph an analysis option? Only has a visualization, right? Yeah, so far it only has a graph view, which is fairly basic uh, and a bit buggy still sometimes. Um, I think, yeah, there's no, there's no analysis uh, tool so far. And as Tillman mentioned earlier, we don't have, I mean, this is not the only to tool we use to look at our system, so we have uh, something like Datadog, which also generates overviews of this. We tried other uh, open source tools before as well to just, like Visceral from Netflix, which, which showed these as graphs. Um, but a graph theory analysis in that regard, no. So I think there were quite many interesting questions, but in view of the time, I think we do one more, and <laughs> then, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, and then uh, yeah, we can talk to the speakers uh, offline or via, via Slack then further. All right, I'll actually cheat and have two questions, but they will be short. <laughs> so, um, first question, I think it was already partially asked, but I want to ask it from a different perspective. How long did it take you to build this, uh, implement this backstage uh, state that you are with? I saw you had like 353 services or so there. How long did it take you to, to build this up, considering all the effort to push the teams, et cetera, to, to make it happen? And the second thing is, like, I, I saw the, the power in this tool for like single service documentation, but how do you rate the capa capability of Backstage to show like overview of the system or the platform and also like the, maybe a, as, a, as a tool to replace architectural diagrams, can you do some views or like, you know, limited scope of services and the, like the in interactions between them, dependencies between them and so on? Let's say something about the technology deployment side. 
you mean the first question? Yeah. Okay. How long it take? Yeah. To talk? Um, well, so we started this in February last year, um, but it wasn't like worked on full time. Um, so mainly during innovation uh, topics, and then recently also just with a fairly small uh, time investment. Um, but I mean, after it was announced with as the the real um, the the one and only software catalog, I guess it took like an one PI more or less for all teams mm -hmm. to. Uh, or most teams to, to get around to uh, documenting their services, but I mean there are always some, some holes that get get filled in later, so it's continuously it's still growing the number obviously also because we're building new services. Yeah, and regarding the architecture diagrams, we still draw them by hand because also if you talk to the Netflix guys, they have thousands of microservices. If you start to generate a diagram from that, that always looks bad. Yeah, I mean, that's why I said, like, code, so you yeah. Can Currently, we link back from backstage to others as an overall diagram. Mm. Okay, then thank you again for the nice talk, and thank you for being here.